is in your order of worship. We're on page 299 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be the kingdom, now and forever. Amen. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name. For you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Why are you so full of heaviness, O 
lesson is a reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that they might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to disciplinarian. For Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
encouraged to celebrate this entrance rite to the body of Christ on Easter Vigil, All Saints, the Baptism of Our Lord, and other major celebrations on the calendar. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this, the biggest being history and tradition of the faith, but while it's a lovely idea, practically it's often really hard to work out. That said, one of the unwritten and lesser known reasons is one we run into today, and that is the luck of the draw of the lectionary. And the chances of stumbling into awkward or difficult passages like demons and swine. <laughs> so here we are. And I do feel like this is an opportunity for a lot of maybe unfortunate jokes for the sake of this gospel reading with questionable taste. Maybe jokes about blue owl or um, other pig jokes. But I'm going to avoid that temptation other than what I have already, already unappropriately done. And indeed, turn to our gospel reading. It is a pretty uncomfortable account. One that my Bible study groups have taken a lot of extra time chewing over. And it doesn't help us this morning that we're dropped into the middle of the story with all that has happened before in the Gospel of Luke far removed. For a bit of context, we have been past, we are long past the opening predictions of Jesus' birth in the Gospel, of the infancy narrative and the shepherds who come to see a baby in the manger. An adolescent, Jesus has long ago lingered in the temple, worrying his parents to death. John the Baptist has made his appearance, and Luke has already told us that at about the age of 30, Jesus has begun his public ministry after spending some time on retreat in the wilderness. Not one to start small, after calling the first of his disciples, Jesus has made big claims in the synagogue about being the fulfillment of Scripture. He also told his neighbors some very hard truths, which, as Luke explains, did not go so very well for him. Jesus has been traveling through Galilee, preaching, driving out spirits, healing, much to the amazement of all. He draws crowds from all over and preaches to them on a plain. After shocking his mother and brothers as claiming all who followed him as his true family, Jesus has led his disciples even farther from home with a rather dramatic crossing of a lake to bring us here now to a place that Luke calls the country of the Gerasenes, a foreign and alien land. Whatever this country might normally be like, their visit is anything but ordinary. Hardly off the boat, they're greeted by a naked homeless man living in a cemetery. A man who had been so much a danger to himself and to others that he had been bound and kept under guard, and even then would still break his restraints and run wild. A man so burdened he has been entirely stripped of his humanity. A man as good as dead, naked among the tombs. Scholars and modern psychologists like to speculate on the possible psychological and medical diagnoses for the legion of ailments credited demons in the first century, multiple personality disorder, epilepsy, and any number of other things that may or may not look like our modern understanding of mental and physical diseases. It can be easy to make our own parallels about the burdens that we each carry, the weight of hard or broken relationships, of addictions, of bad habits, of economics and class and status, of the systems we're a part of that are so beyond our own control. And yet, no matter how much of these burdens we bear ourselves, how some we encounter, some we know, seem to draw more than their fair share of the hard stuff, the trials and events, the problems that weigh our bodies and spirits down. I think at the end of the day, if these first century stories are allegories for the scars of hard living or mental or physical ailment, or if they record the burden of actual demons, the point is the same. What seems to be insurmountable bondage? But then Jesus does what Jesus does. He orders all that is in the man to come out, to leave him be, and he is set loose from that bondage, free from burdens, estrangement. Jesus restores this unnamed man, this beloved child of God, to himself to his community, to his place in the world. It's interesting to wonder why this is so very frightening, why a man made well, clothed and calm, sitting at the feet of the one who healed him, inspires such fear in those who gather. This miracle of restoration, this breaking of bonds, this return to personhood, doesn't invoke wonder or joy in those who witness the transformation. Rather than wanting him to hang about and heal others, they ask Jesus to leave, perhaps because it's so drastic, so sudden. We don't know how long this man has suffered. Perhaps there are those who have never known him to be well, to be ordinary. 
Perhaps they're afraid that one who can cast out demons can summon them. Perhaps they simply don't know how to deal with something so transformative or life-changing. Or perhaps, like those supernatural forces who recognize Jesus for who he is, they too have some inkling of what Jesus is all about, of what following him would really mean. And after all, after the healing and the traveling, what comes next is having to love your neighbor. Whatever the case, Jesus doesn't argue. He and those with him, silent throughout, get back in the boat. <laughs> and the man, well, he might to come along, but instead Jesus tells him to stay, saying to him, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he does. A new disciple carrying the good news, carrying the good news to his home, returning to his community. While the transformation of baptism is by and large far less dramatic than this restorative account, there is an unexpected parallel. The good news in this otherwise uncomfortable story is that encounters with Jesus lead to wholeness, to being included, to being a part of something beyond ourselves, a belonging to something that both celebrates our individual personhood and yet makes us a part of something greater. As Paul tells the Galatians in our epistle reading, in baptism, the things that separate us don't matter. They aren't the point. Each of us together are one. We truly live as followers of Christ. The things that mark us is different. The measures that the world holds up to compare us to ourselves or others, well, they just aren't the priority. Under Christ, we are all equals. Not to be held up to standards of wealth, of birth, of gender or education, of family or birthplace, but siblings, beloved children of God. Now that isn't about taking away what makes each of us special or denying our gifts. It's taking away the ranking of them. It's taking away the constant need to measure what is best or enough or brightest. The scary, world-changing, bondage-breaking, liberating truth that Christ offers is that we are each beloved children of God. And then once we know that, Jesus asks us to follow him, to love and declare what God has done for us. In a moment, we will each have a chance to consider what that means for each of us communally and as individually as we renew our baptismal covenant and how we aspire to live with each other and go out into the world as beloved of God. While the words of the Book of Common Prayer are relatively new, the ideals they express are not. They come down to us from some of the oldest, truest ideals, love of God and love of neighbor. Ideals we will strive to embody with God's help. Amen. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? Amen. Do you 
you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. This question is for all of us gathered. Will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support this person in their life in Christ? We will. Let us join with those who are committing themselves to Christ and renew our own baptismal covenant. Do you believe in God the Father?
wives who are we praying by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those who here are cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Savior. To him, to you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Grant 
that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. Uh, for those of you who are visiting with us as we celebrate communion, know that all are welcome to come up to the rail. We do uh, receive a wafer and a real wine. You are welcome to just take the bread if you prefer, or you can uh, take the wafer and sit from the cup for it and sink if you would rather not. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Because in Jesus Christ our Lord, you have received us as your sons and daughters, made us citizens of your kingdom, and given us the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and his blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, remember, God made you, God sees you, God knows you, and God loves you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.